I'd like to say hello to everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Griffith Kauser. I'm a policy officer at the European Polar Board, which is a membership organization representing the polar programs of 29 different national research agencies, uh, universities, funding agencies, etc. Uh, within Europe. The webinar is being recorded and will be available afterwards on the SOCHIC YouTube channel. Um, so just a few words about SOCHIC, uh, which is an EU-funded Horizon 2020 project, which is focused on measuring and understanding heat and carbon exchanges between the atmosphere and the Southern Ocean. The Southern Ocean is, by some estimates, responsible for about 60 to 90 percent of excess heat absorbed by world oceans each year. And despite such pivotal climate importance, its representation in global climate models is one of the main weaknesses of climate simulations these days. Um, so SOCIC aims to add data and understanding to these processes and fill in important data gaps in Southern Ocean monitoring. Uh, SOCIC began in August 2018 and comprises 18 different institutions. Um, the European Polar Board is the lead for work package eight, which is policy communication and dissemination. And so as part of this, we are conducting a webinar series on all of the work packages. You can find the other uh, webinars on the other work packages on the SOCIC YouTube channel. Today, we're doing work package seven. Uh, so work package seven is led by uh, Dr. Antonio Novellino. It is called Data Management and Connection to Climate Services. Uh, the lead project partner is ETT. Um, and we're going to talk about how it connects to the SOCIC project at large and to answer any questions that you may have. We'll take questions at the end of the webinar. So you can use the Q&A function or I've, I've opened the chat so that you can ask questions directly in the chat as well. As a brief introduction to Dr. Novellino, um, he has a PhD in biotechnology and bioengineering from the University of Genoa. And among many titles that he holds, he's the research manager at ETT. He's also the coordinator at EMODnet Physics, which is a branch of the EMODnet initiative by DG Mare. Uh, he's also de deputy manager of Copernicus Marine Data Service and is involved in many other data management initiatives. So with that, I will ask Dr. Novellino to begin the presentation. Thank you very much. So it's a very, I mean, big pleasure to present some of the activities that we are doing in uh, SOCIC and in VP7. And uh, I also would like to welcome all the attenders uh, uh, for this uh, more or less hour of discussion. So I'm going to share my presentation first. Uh, should be like that. And if you can confirm that you see it, Do you see uh, it? For me, yeah, there we go. Okay, perfect. So, sorry, okay. Okay, so then. As introduced by Griffin, that I would like to thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, today we are going to discuss a bit about the data management and connection to climate service and how uh, within SOCIC we are uh, facing and uh, operating uh, towards this uh, this goal. Okay. Yeah. Before that, I mean, uh, need to uh, repeat some of the uh, topics and ideas that Griffin has already presented because it's quite important to understand the global picture in order to see which is the importance uh, and the uh, I mean and the goal of the data management in a project like so chic. So we know that sea covers about uh, two thirds of the Earth's surface and about 40% of the world population lives within 200 kilometers from uh, the coast. And the ocean is a source for uh, many things, for, uh, for food, for employment, for transportation, tourism, energy. And of course, as I've already introduced, the uh, ocean regulates short and long-term climate. 
If we look at the Copernicus uh, ocean monitoring impacts, uh, we see that somehow, I mean, the situation is not uh, nice promising because we have an increase in the mean sea level. We have an increase of the heat content in the water. We have uh, acidification of the ocean. So we, we need to, to understand why, which are the process and how to deal uh, in order to uh, uh, improve the situation. And in order to do this, it's uh, quite important to uh, study remote areas in which the uh, human presence is less uh, consistent. And so, as already uh, said by Griffin, it's quite important to study Southern Ocean because Southern Ocean is responsible for uh, something in between 60 to 90 percent of the excesses of it uh, absorbed globally. It's, uh, uh, it is largely controlling uh, the decadal variability scale of the Earth carbon budget. And uh, on top of that, uh, the Southern Ocean is poorly represented in the global climate models. So we need to act on this. We need to improve uh, the understanding of uh, the uh, Southern Ocean impact on uh, uh, carbon heat uh, effect. And so then, uh, okay, we are speaking about uh, our project. So we are speaking about uh, SOCHIC that as I already introduced, it, uh, we are trying to improve the understanding of the carbonate budget in the ocean, uh, but bringing together all the new observation uh, together with the modeling effort. So the goal is really to understand and study the IRC uh, ice interface dynamics uh, and uh, the relationship between this interface dynamics and the process in the water column. So from ice formation up to the actually bottom down to the water content current formation in order to identify which are the critical sensitivities that should be uptaken in the models in order to reduce these uncertainties in the long-term prediction. And thus already introduced, we have a quite nice and large consortium that is working together in order to tackle these, uh, these issues. Um, so SHIC uh, is organized in uh, different work packages uh, which each of uh, which is really uh, trying to understand one specific uh, um, item of this uh, long and complex uh, chain. So we have, uh, I mean, activities and colleagues that are working uh, on IRC fluxes, uh, uh, some others in upper ocean ventilation pathways, uh, deep ocean ventilation pathways, uh, a group large polynia events, uh, uh, the impact of the couplet uh, canal system uh, and the variability trends of it in carbon uptake uh, and storage. And together with this, uh, these that are more scientific uh, work packages and activities, of course, we need to deal with the data because we, we said we are bringing together all the new data together with the model, uh, modeling effort. And so we need to have a proper data management also to be able and connect all the outcome of the project, project towards the climate services. And as I said, I mean, we already had some uh, seminars that are presenting in deep the different activities from the other work packages. And I'm sharing also, I mean, the links uh, that Griffin already mentioned. So we say it, uh, that in this context, the ma data management somehow is um, uh, central to the activity of uh, SOCHIC development because we can see this uh, uh, picture how all the different activities are uh, uh, dealing with the data management because when we collect data, when we uh, process data, if we uh, need old uh, data, if we need some uh, specific uh, data collection in order to feed models uh, and so on, we need to deal with the data. And so we need an infrastructure that is helping our scientific activity in order to answer and run these kind of uh, activities. So we here we see how the VP7 is uh, uh, connected to each of the different activities that we are running. And on top of that, of course, uh, all the outcomes that are coming from the different scientific activities are producing new products, new collection, and these are also uh, of importance needed to be uptaken by uh, SOCHIC stakeholders. And 
the data management infrastructure so chic is a place where all these stakeholders can go and find uh, these outcomes so the goal of the data management is really to enable discovering open access view and download of the data generated and collected by uh, the SOCIC project. And to, um, I mean, all the, uh, let's say, um, methodology and the approach for the data management is developed in cooperation and to be interoperable with already existing infrastructure like Immonet Physics, Copernicus Marine Service, uh, CDataNet, uh, Network of uh, uh, National Geographic Data Centers, uh, and um, even uh, in a wider perspective. So we are also aiming and offering our activities towards the global ocean observing system, and in particular with the Southern Ocean Observing System. And to do so, we need to develop, by means of the data management uh, work package, the SOCIC fairness, that is uh, the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and usability of the data and products that we are developing. And why uh, it's so important to keep in mind this fair concept, because uh, in the uh, value chain, uh, we have a big need for data. So uh, if we are looking at, I mean, as we said, we are facing, uh, I mean, uh, global scale climate change uh, studies. So we need to have data that are uh, uptaken by modeling models in order to run new uh, scenarios. Then we can verify some of the scenarios with new data, and then we can better understand and improve also our modeling effort in order to be uh, I mean, more precise and reduce the uncertainties uh, for our uh, long-term perspective. And to do this, of course, we need data because data are improving uh, the model. Here in the bottom of uh, this slide, we can see uh, a nice picture in which we see if we are only using models without assimilation, we have, a, I mean, a certain estimate of the process. Uh, if we have some uh, um, in-situ observation, then we can uh, improve quite a lot the uh, accuracy of the data. With assimil by assimilating, uh, assimilating this data. Uh, and so this is quite important. And it is important because we are dealing and we are uh, interoperating with the global effort for the ocean observing system. So the GOOS is, uh, I mean, an international program in which, uh, which is led by the intergovernmental Geographic Commission of the UNESCO and is uh, um, co-sponsored by the World Meteorological Organization, uh, the United Nations Environmental Program and the International Science Council. The GUS, I mean, is uh, dealing with the data management at the global level by working uh, in a sort of hierarchical structure. We have several regional alliances that are dealing with given specific area. So we have, as you can see in the, in the picture, we have different regions, and then we have the different alliance that are dealing with the data. But as we said, so SHIC is um, working, is dealing with the Southern Ocean. And so our primary, uh, let's say, stakeholder in this con uh, context uh, is the Southern Ocean Observing System. In, that is, again, a community which is really sharing the effort for data collection, data processing, and understanding of the different processes that we have in the ocean, uh, both the physical one, but also the biological one and the chemical one and so on. And so everything that we need to do within the data management uh, and the interoperability towards uh, our main stakeholders has to think about this kind of communities as primary target for uh, for uh, for our project, but uh, we say that uh, I mean, um, ocean is crucial not only for uh, I mean for many many uh, topics. And uh, nowadays, also at the political agenda, we see, uh, uh, I mean, an increase of uh, the awareness about this, uh, this problem. And so ocean is uh, getting, uh, uh, I mean, a very high priority in different uh, European programs. In fact, if we look at the European framework, we have several programs that are dealing, uh, are considering 
the importance or a focusing on ocean uh, data collection and data processing. And on top of this, we have two main programs at the European level that are really focusing on uh, data uh, collection and data processing and data forecast. We have the Copernicus Marine Program, the Copernicus Program, that is, I mean, the main European program for uh, Earth observation and uh, it I mean, it is a very big and complex prog uh, program, but he has a pillar that is really focusing on uh, on marine. And then we have the modern, that, that, that is the European Marine Observation Data Network, which are, let's say, for us that are uh, a European project, uh, two of the key stakeholders for, uh, I mean, the data interoperability that we are, uh, uh, we are aiming. But of course, we also have the European Polar Board. I won't spend any uh, more words on that because Griffin has already introduced brilliantly uh, the, the, the context. Uh, going back to the European framework of ocean data, uh, as we said, we have uh, different um, DGs that are the directorate of the European Commission that are dealing with the, the data, data management. And, and so uh, lately, uh, at the European level, they also started these uh, uh, missions, the ocean mission, in order to deal with the data, understanding the processes, uh, and, and plan also mitigation and restoring uh, actions. But to do uh, this, uh, we need to integrate all the different information and data that we may have from uh, satellite observation, from numerical modeling, uh, data simulation, and of course, in situ observation. And to do this, we also need projects and activities in order to uh, define common methods, common data tools, standard, and also share the knowledge of what has been developed in this in this program. So, um, so then, uh, as we said, we have uh, some key um, programs and projects that are really uh, working towards uh, the data collection and uh, um, ocean data collection and ocean understanding. The first program, uh, as we mentioned before, is the Copernicus Marine Service that here we can see, I mean, a nice summary of the, I mean, uh, big effort that is behind the system because uh, uh, Copernicus Marine Service uh, is really uh, working on making available global and regional uh, ocean monitoring and forecasting services. So it is uh, uh, collecting uh, uh, observation from multi-year perspective. So you may find data collection that are ranging from 10 to 45 years then they are producing a real time um, collection, data collection, and also forecast, uh, short term forecast, and, and, and medium term forecast. And uh, the Copernicus Marine Service is also trying to work towards the essential ocean variables. So it's really focusing on the blue, uh, white, and green ocean variables that are the physics, the sea ice, and the biogeochemistry. Uh, and so we can already see how close we are as a SOCHI community to the needs uh, of a program like Copernicus uh, in order to be interoperable, interoperable and, and uh, dial and make in place a good dialogue. And why it, it is quite important to have uh, in mind this kind of activities? Because uh, if you want to have, but as we said, if we want to have better forecast, if we want to have better models, we need to collect information. We need to collect data. We need to collect in situ data, and we need to assess also the old uh, data. And uh, while, uh, let's say, it's easier to do it, uh, let's say, in areas where uh, we are living, so European areas or uh, uh, areas where, uh, I mean, people can easily access, when we speak about remote areas like the uh, Southern Ocean, it's more, uh, it's more difficult. And so any effort that we are doing should be interoperable, should be target also serving these other programs. And why it is so important? Because, for example, if we look at, uh, I mean, the users or the application of a program like Copernicus, we see how huge could be the impact of the activities that we're doing at a social level, because we can really offer our activities, our science uh, to thousands and thousands of subscribers or users of this data. 
really to help them in uh, dealing with different topics and different problems uh, going from uh, environmental monitoring to uh, climate and uh, adaptation, ocean health, and so on. So we are really offering, we have to keep in mind that our activities can really be of uh, uh, importance and can improve the activity of many other end users. Um, and as I've already said, I mean, it's important because uh, although Copernicus is collecting uh, and managing, uh, I mean, the big effort of all the satellite mission, European satellite mission, then in order to improve the quality of this information, to calibrate this data, we need in situ observation. And that's also why Copernicus is working quite uh, a lot in uh, tight collaboration with the European Environmental Agency, the Eurogoose, that is the European component of the goose uh, and use that uh, should, I mean, be the European global effort for ocean observing system, and of course, uh, um, with Imanet. But say that Copernicus is, I mean, while Copernicus is, uh, let's say, the hub for the uh, Earth observation and modeling effort, uh, if we want to think about the hub or the house for the in-situ observation, we need to think about uh, Imonet, uh, which lately has been uh, centralized. And so we have one single place under the European domain in which we can find all the in-situ uh, data collection effort from different European partners. So again, this is another key stakeholder for the activity that we're doing in, uh, in, in Stoshik. Uh, um, Imonet has been developed uh, by thematic uh, approach. So we have these seven uh, thematism, which are dealing with the different typology of data. And if we uh, think about uh, what we're doing uh, in Soshik, so the kind of parameters or processes that we are uh, studying, then of course, uh, Imonet physics uh, is uh, the key stakeholder. And uh, because Imonet physics is uh, really dealing uh, with the, let's say, collection and uh, uh, linking of uh, um, the different in situ observation from parameters like temperature in the water column, salinity in the water column, wave currents, ice data, and so on. And uh, Imonet is also uh, in charge for connecting and uh, offering at, the, let's say, European level all the uh, in situ uh, effort that is dealing with both operational data, so near real time data, as well as also with reprocessed and validated long term data collection. So everything that Soshik is developing, I mean, it's really of high interest for this uh, program and this project in particular. And this is just to give you a picture of uh, the outcome that uh, has been done uh, for the past 10 years uh, in uh, linking and integrating, uh, I mean, the effort of different institutes that are collecting data uh, in, the, in the global seas uh, by MRFACES. This is a view of uh, the uh, observational points uh, for the uh, past 30 years. Of course, here we have an artifact because each platform, each collecting platform is not as big as the, let's say, its representation on the map. So we know that, I mean, the collection effort has to, to contain, and, but already in this picture, you can see that uh, the areas in which we are missing, uh, I mean, the most of the data are the Arctic areas, Arctic and the polar areas, and Southern Ocean is one of the key and primary target for uh, uh, modern physics too. But how to deal with the such pressure? <laughs> so we need to adopt common recommendations that are developed at the European level. We need to develop uh, an up-to-date data infrastructure in order to be able to consume data from uh, all these uh, uh, programs and projects, as well as to offer in, uh, let's say, machine-to-machine -machine fashion, so without uh, big effort from the stakeholders and user uh, to take the outcome from what we're developing. And to do this, we need to develop tools to facilitate also data discovery. Um, if we look at the metadata, then what we're doing in uh, the VP7 of uh, Soshik is uh, really adopting and applying uh, 
uh, the European recommendation for uh, uh, metadata. So for example, uh, these are some of the key, uh, let's say, uh, metadata that we need to use in order to facilitate the interoperability of the data. So we need to give the name of the identification code of the platform as we are doing uh, collection in the remote areas, uh, we always have to register WMO code. So our platforms are uh, already have uh, these, their names uh, under the WMO code. So if we have this, this list, it's an easy way to inform our stakeholder that the new data is coming uh, from that platform. We need to use common uh, naming uh, of uh, the variables. And so, for example, for the um, ocean data, so ocean variables, uh, it's quite important to adopt and use uh, the uh, vocabularies that uh, have been developed uh, in within the CDATANET effort. So for example, uh, for naming the variables, it's important to use the P02, the P01, and so on. Uh, and then of course, we need to use common reference for time and uh, geographical position. These are a couple of standards that we need to use. But it's also important to give a name to the data set. So it's important to have this unique identificator uh, in order to facilitate also the um, uh, understanding of who is doing uh, the work from one side, but at the same time also to facilitate the integrators to avoid taking the same data from different sources. So avoid the duplications of the data when you need to consume data and do further processes. And so a good approach is to register it, and especially if we are dealing with delayed mode data, and this is the main, I mean, mostly the case for, uh, for Sochic data, it is important to register, I mean, this data set, the data collection with the DOI. In Europe, we have uh, several uh, trusted repositories. We have the Sinoe, the Pangea, the Nodo. These are three of the main one, but there are many others. And then usually the good practice is also that uh, the collection, uh, collecting an institute has to deal with the trusted repository that is present in their, in their country. So for example, if you are a French institute, then for sure you go for Sinoa. If you are from Italy, you may go to a different one. Then of course, uh, it's also important, as we say, to give visibility to the people that are working uh, behind the scenes. So all the people that are collecting the data. So the Institute, and it's important to use, for example, the European Marine um, uh, Directory for the Marine uh, Institutes, that is the Edmo code. And of course, also to use vocabularies or controlled vocabularies for identifying the people. Lately, I mean, there is a big momentum for the ORCID because uh, then it's easier also for integrators to mention uh, the people and the people, uh, I mean, the researchers to be, uh, I mean, to get credit for the activities that they're doing. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, the most important recommendation are also related to how to, uh, I mean, about the uh, data policy and how to access the data. So at the European level, uh, there is a very big push in order to have easy access to data. So whenever it's possible, this data should be open. And so it means that they also have an open data policy. And the Common Creative Framework is really offering a very nice uh, framework, sorry for repeating, uh, context for offering uh, data. Um, it should be uh, applied CCBY, that is one of the most open one, as much as possible. And then, of course, uh, I mean, this should be applied for sure to the metadata and then also to the data. Uh, to say that it's also possible to have uh, some, uh, let's say, embargo of the data, but uh, um, together with the embargo, so to complete the qualification of the data, to have the publication of the data, so also to prove the scientific effort of the activity that we're doing, that is fine, but then it's also important that we declare, I mean, which is the time of release of the data. And this is, these are crucial for a data management, uh, uh, let's say work package or a data management, uh, data management um, plan because uh, uh, 
as we said, as we have many stakeholders, these stakeholders are really waiting and carving for the data that we may um, disclose. And they can help us if we apply these policies uh, to increase the impact of the scientific activities that we're doing. So once we uh, make our data available, then they can consume this data. And so we can track how much of our data or our effort is really serving these uh, European progress, programs. And this is something that we can report in our reporting uh, uh, reports to the commission when we need to do for the project uh, fulfillment. Uh, but uh, what does it mean having an up-to-date data infrastructure? Okay, it means to use tools, open tools that are facilitating the data interoperability and the data, uh, um, uh, data linkage, the machine to machine interoperability, as well as the user discovery of the data. In SOCHIC, uh, we applied uh, this, uh, let's say, concept of having uh, three uh, um, layers uh, for the data management. Uh, this is, of course, a simplification, but uh, uh, well represent how we are dealing with data. So we have a basic layers in which we uh, are more dealing with the data. So we have uh, a system uh, which is uh, <clears throat> connecting uh, the, our partners. So, uh, I mean, the, our colleagues that are co really collecting data. And so they can either expose the data or drop the data into this system. Then we do some uh, uh, check uh, of the metadata in order to have an harmonized uh, management of this data and facilitate the exposure of the information that we are doing. I believe we've lost Antonio, unless it's me that's having problems. The data to further, uh, further levels. So uh, at the uh, top level, then we have the application layer. That is, uh, I mean, all the different applications that you may have in place in order to consume the data. So for example, you have the map viewer or the catalogs. And by this, uh, that are more, let's say, human interfaces, you can easily offer your data to other colleagues. And uh, to do this, we are implementing, we are using a combination of, uh, of open software like RDAP, GeoServer, GeoNetwork, and then sometimes we also need to do some ad hoc APIs. Uh, one key uh, message here is uh, that we need to think about a federation of data sources because already in SOCHIC we have many pa partners. So we cannot think about that each and every one is sending one specific data to the data management and so on. We have to somehow improve also, I mean, the way and facilitating the activity of our colleagues in order to have this common place in which we can offer the data. So somehow we are also pushing a new concept in which we have not to need, uh, uh, we have uh, not to move the data. So instead of thinking about uh, a pushing system in which we drop data, we send data, uh, it's uh, better to think about a real federation of the data. So together, I mean, within the um, activities of the uh, SOCIC Work Package 7 on data management, we are also uh, implementing and supporting uh, the implementation of uh, these tools at the institute level. So then we have uh, somehow an easier and, and faster interoperability of the data. So if at the institute level we install, for example, RDAP, then we can implement virtual link between the RDAP that is at the institute level and the RDAP that is behind um, in the uh, social data infrastructure. So everything is already connected as soon as uh, new data is flowing into the Institute uh, data management system, we see it at the project level. But when it, this data is ending up in the um, SOCIC backend data management structure, it's immediately exposed also to our uh, SOCIC stakeholders. So um, 
system and project like Copernicus Marine uh, Service, uh, Imonet Physics, uh, and the other ones can directly consume this data without asking or without uh, doing any further effort. And of course, I mean, to do this, uh, as we said before, one key message is that the data should be uh, CCBY. So integrators can then consume this data and expose this data without leading any kind of uh, IPRs, but giving the proper right, uh, the proper citation and acknowledgement to, to the people that are collecting the data. That in, in this case could be the Stoshik project by means of the different institutes and the researchers that are doing the job at the field. And so this way we, are, we have no need to move data. It's really an easier integration and easier access to the data. It, it's also easier to give acknowledgement to all the people behind the scene. And then we are really implementing the fairness of the system. And uh, in this um, uh, short video, you can see uh, I mean, this concept to put in place. So, for example, we know we deployed uh, one specific uh, buoys that is the one that is named uh, uh, 6902893. So, as soon as this data was released into the Sushik uh, backend, by means of this uh, in, uh, native interoperability between Sushik and the other. Uh, stakeholders, it was possible for physics to connect to this data and see, I mean, this data, metadata, directly into uh, the uh, modern portal. But now let's go to what uh, more on uh, some other tools that we are implementing in Sochik. We said one first level of, uh, I mean, uh, activities that we're dealing in VP7 is uh, implementing the common standards. And we spoke about uh, metadata and vocabularies. A second level is uh, um, the implementation of uh, up-to-date uh, data, uh, open data management tools. We spoke about the uh, backend infrastructure and tools like Yardap, uh, Joseph, and so on. And the third level uh, we mentioned it is uh, um, uh, web interface that uh, let the people to browse and uh, see the data before consuming this data. So to do this, we are developing within the uh, WPC7, the Sochik Map Viewer. Here you see how this interface is looking like. And so uh, you can see three, uh, actually four main areas. We have one uh, area that is in the left part of uh, the web, uh, in which we have uh, the basic layers. So you can load, I mean, shape files that are presenting, uh, for example, uh, some areas of interest, uh, some layers that have been produced by other entities. And of course, if you click on the eye, you get all the credits and information about the source of the data. Then we have, um, uh, uh, I mean, a, a matrix that is helping the user in order to identify and find the data that are of interest of Sushik uh, uh, project. So here we find we may find also all data that we are consuming as Sushik project in order to do some of the science that we're doing. And uh, I would like to say that uh, this kind of matrix is something freshly new. Uh, for the community because has been developed in collaboration with uh, all the people uh, in the, the VP7 in order to facilitate really the uh, access to the data, trying and identify, I mean, the given uh, parameter or the given platform really in a couple of clicks. So this matrix is working in a way that you can select the collecting platform in the, from the column, for example, the ship, or uh, you can select uh, a given parameter, temperature, for example, that is the first row. And then, of course, uh, in the cross uh, of the rows and the columns, you may find, I mean, the data set you uh, may be interested. And when you select one of these button, now we are going to see how it works in a few seconds, then you have uh, one given card that is also presenting that specific data collection. And then, of course, everything is popping up in the central uh, part in the body of the web page. But let's see how it works in practice. As I was saying, you can select by rows and columns. So you may select by um, parameters or by platform. Here, we are, for example, we selected 
the sea temperature. And now we are uh, looking at some of the product, products that we may found. We saw the uh, sea surface temperature as collected by the SOCAT effort. Then we saw some, uh, I mean, sea temperature uh, as collected. I mean, the temperature along the trajectory. And then we also can see, uh, I mean, some more um, uh, advanced process data, like climatologies, uh, or uh, in this case, we are looking at uh, the sea surface temperature <coughs> as produced by NOAA. And then for each uh, product, you may interact with the product itself on the web page. So if you click on um, a specific uh, point, then you may have some further data or metadata. It depends, of course, on the nature of the, the project. Uh, lately, we also in, um, in, ingested uh, some more advanced reanalysis. For example, here we can see a picture from the Glorious 12v1 on the sea surface 8. And uh, if uh, here we can see another nice product uh, from the Glorious uh, uh, family. I go again on this because it's very nice. Oh, sorry. Uh, here you see, for example, the sea ice coverage. I, of course, uh, running uh, the animation very fast, but you can see the sea ice uh, extent over several years. And all these kind of data, besides I mean, being available for making a nice video like the one that I'm showing, you can really interact with all the, this data. So if you click on a point, get the full time series uh, uh, of the product uh, in that specific point. Uh, another way to interact with the system is, uh, uh, of course, uh, by consuming the data. Okay, now uh, um, we, uh, as a user, um, browse the system, understand, understood which are the data that we want to uh, download in order to be able and uh, do our analysis. So if we are interested, for example, in uh, a data set from an Argo, then I check, uh, I take the WM code of the Argo, the platform ID, then I, as you've seen in the movie, then I go to downloading feature, then I ended up in the Soshik um, RDAP. Then I just copy and paste the platform ID. Then I set some more information. I, I'm selecting the parameters that I want. And then I just submit. Then I can check if the data is the one that I wanted. Or here we see the platform ID, the timing, the uh, latitude, the longitude, and all the information about the data. And then, OK. I mean, I, I would like to consume this data. Okay, so I'm moving from uh, the web representation of this uh, time series, uh, actually this profile, to the CSV. And so if I just change HTML table in CSV, then I download the data. And here I'm, look, I'm showing how easy it is to download one profile and import it into a spreadsheet system. This is... Uh, what you get in your uh, in, in your uh, laptop. And then you can really work on this uh, or can consume this together with other data that you may have uh, uh, and do for the processing. But uh, this is not uh, uh, the end of the story because uh, when you are looking at one platform, you may also be interested uh, in, a, in understanding, uh, uh, having a preliminary look at, uh, for example, some of the parameters, or you want to include uh, this specific uh, uh, data representation into uh, a third system. And so in Sochik, we are also offering uh, these APIs, uh, that is a widget. And so if you open the platform and then uh, you go to this API tool, then you see that you have this uh, uh, unique uh, uh, URL and you can play with that. For example, here I'm extending also the, the time of uh, the, uh, the data collection. These data are coming from Imonet, for example. That's why you see Imonet on the back end of the, 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 uh, the plot. And then you can have a consume all these uh, uh, profiles. And you can use this widget into your web portal or you can uh, download this data as we saw a uh, few seconds uh, before. So 
doing all these activities uh, at metadata level, at backend infrastructure level, at, uh, let's say, uh, data uh, uh, discovery level. Uh, we had, during these three years of project, uh, we actually had a quite big impact of Sushik because uh, um, together with physics, uh, we really improved quite a lot the accessibility to the Southern Ocean uh, data uh, collection. And in fact, here we see also some of uh, the process uh, that uh, helped the Southern Ocean uh, uh, system in, uh, in order to have uh, a dedicated viewer which all the community can really find uh, all the global effort uh, for the Southern Oceans. So we see that um, starting from a collaboration between physics and SUS in order to unlock more data, little by little when Sushik entered into force uh, with the effort and with the capacity of Sushik to develop new tools to present the data, we were able to offer to the SUS community a new way to present the data. And now we ended up with a new version of the SUS map that is mainly based on the SOSHIC uh, web portal. In fact, if you see, if you go to the SUS map, that is uh, susmap.aq, uh, uh, you see that the look and feel is very similar to the um, our Sochic map viewer. And if you click on the credits, you see that, uh, I mean, Sochic is very well uh, awarded about this activity. As well as uh, you can see that in the back end of Sochic, uh, we are hosting some of the SUS data that without SUS were not uh, available at all. And uh, on top of this, another nice impact is that, uh, as you may know, this summer we are going to have the SUS Symposium in Hobart, in Australia, and we are going to have a daily workshop in order to learn how to use the SUS map. And you see that this activity is uh, uh, supported by, by our effort and DVP7. So now I'm getting to uh, the conclusion. I hope uh, I was uh, interested, it was interesting for you, but uh, what we need to do, uh, what's next? What we need to keep doing? We need to add more data set in Sushik and data collection. Of course, some should be the new one that are little by little coming from the effort of our colleagues that are running uh, I mean, activities in the Southern Ocean. We need to keep improving the system, the viewer in particular, as well as also the uh, presentation of the data collection in our backend, because it, it is nice, uh, but it's uh, important to uh, keep working on that in order to keep improving uh, the user experience and the accessibility to the, the data. And then, of course, we are also planning uh, to develop uh, some mini webinar in, uh, in order to show how to use uh, the different products uh, and data collection that we have in the system. Because at the moment, we, are, we have a very, uh, let's say, huge amount of collection and data that are accessible in the, in the system. And it would be good for us to do this uh, series in order to facilitate the understanding of which features are available in the web portal, as well as uh, how, how to consume in easy ways uh, all this uh, data and data collection. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I hope that you enjoyed the, this presentation. And of course, if there is any question, I'm really happy to answer. <laughs> I don't know, Griffin, uh, if you want to take over in order to see the yes. if there is any specific question, because I, I cannot see the Q&A section from uh, my view of the system. Right. So, hi, I'm Peter Elsad. I'm a project officer of the EPB, the European Polar Board, and um, Griffith has a little bit of an issue with the laptop, so I'm just uh, filling oh, okay. in here. <laughs> I, um, I do not see any questions in the chat um unfortunately but thank you for the very great
presentation. So I would want to ask still if anyone has a question, maybe you can post it now. And if not, um, I think we carry on. Um, Griffith will also be back in a minute. So just uh, keeping up the torch for now. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, so I don't see anything. Um, well, meanwhile, I invite uh, all the I mean, uh, attenders to have a look at our uh, web portal that is uh, uh, map.soshikeiphoneh2020.eu. So please go there, play with the, the portal. And of course, tell us about your feedback, because as we said, we need to keep, we would like to keep improving it. And so if you uh, send us feedback on uh, which is the usability or the experience that you have while using that, it's quite important for us. As well as if you cannot find some key data set or data collection that you may use running your uh, research, uh, it would be no, it would be good to know because we can work in order to connect to that, uh, that data set of data collection. See if we, it is already available somewhere and then make the connection. Thank you. I think I just posted the link uh, you referred to in the chat. Um, there's also a question if there is a link with C data net. Uh, yes, there is a link because uh, everything that we do, uh, as we said, we are adopting uh, all the vocabulary effort that CDataNet is developing, as well as we are uh, in uh, connection with all the national geographic data centers. So when we know that new data is flowing towards the SOSHIC, especially from the partners, the SOSHIC partners, so it, we are thinking, I mean, we are focusing on new data, then uh, we are uh, also informing uh, the CDATANET community about these new data flowing to the system so they can also take over and do all the process that they need to do in order to map this data by, adopt, um, by applying the, I mean, the quality check and quality flag uh, and assigning also a CDI to the data collection. That is a quite important tool in order to facilitate the CDATANET community to consume this new data. Thanks. I um, I see Griffith is back, so he will uh, take over, but thank you for having me for a minute. <laughs> Apologies for that. Windows no updates are just one of those things that uh, I think we're going to have to live with for the rest of our lives. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation. I, I really only missed the last the last minute of it that was that was a very comprehensive look at uh, marine data in general and, and what the Sochik project has been doing. So um, let me load up the chat here. If anyone has any questions, then the chat should be open for everyone to use and there is also the Q&A function. So I'd encourage anybody who has any questions to please go ahead and ask them and I can read them here to Antonio. But um, in the meantime, let me just ask, there, you, you've got the Sochik map, which you demonstrated and which we saw and which is quite, quite impressive. Um, but I wonder, there are a lot of uh, visual data portals out there, a lot of uh, map data portals that exist for marine data or for infrastructure data or for all sorts of different types of data and i was wondering if you could sort of speak to the the practical uses of data visualization uh if there's any specific challenges to that but but generally when we're trying to get people to have marine data be more accessible to them uh, what what's the biggest added value of having that as as a map based interface? I would say the very first, <laughs> let's say, added value is that you I mean browsing a map, you can see if 
there is a, a, a data a data product in a place and so you may uh, contact the people that are uh, i mean are doing that activity or develop that specific data collection or data uh, product and uh, ask for using or downloading this data or being in contact in order to develop common research. So having tools that are presenting where the effort is uh, done, it's quite important. Uh, as, uh, the second point is that when you're starting a new research, I mean, if we think about, I mean, also what we're doing in Sochik, the first things that you usually do is a sort of inventory of uh, the data that you may find in a place. This is because you need to understand if you have enough data or if you need to run one specific action and collect new data in a given uh, place. So having uh, these kind of tools facilitate also the planning of new activities. Then, of course, I mean, as let's say I'm somehow an expert user, if I want to uh, see, uh, find, I mean, data and data collection, having, uh, let's say, a, an easy to use web interface that lets you to click and, and check and download and stuff like that is an added value because then you need, you don't need to spend time in order to learn how to consume, I mean, how to run a script in whatever language uh, in order to connect to a data source. You just go there and download, and then you focus on your activity. So these are some of the, I mean, very clear advantages for doing that. Then, of course, I mean, we may have uh, a bit of duplication of effort in uh, uh, viewer presentation, but then somehow, uh, I mean, it, in case of Soshik, I would say that, I mean, the, let's say the very nice strategy that we fostered that was to try to, to uh, do all of our effort in, uh, really to support one big community, that is the SUS community. So everything we're doing, it's really uh, to update and serve this community that is a big community. So we, uh, we're, we're targeting to a key stakeholder. We are using Soshik, um, web viewer like a sort of testing interface, uh, I mean, staging in the interface in order to test some products and uh, features. And then we publish into, let's say, the real system that is the SUS map. And this is somehow very good because uh, when uh, the project we finish, so should we finish, we know that there will be a legacy of what we did. And so we will keep offering uh, the SUS community a system to access and browse the data. So we, I mean, developed a sort of cornerstone of for this community. And this is something that is very nice to, to say. Uh, at the same time, it's also important somehow to have a bit of duplication of this uh, map viewing system, because then you can also localize the effort of a given project. So we are so chic, we can prove that we are doing something because we have our brand branded uh, entity in which we are presenting uh, something that we are doing. And so also for the reviewer, it's easier to, to understand that you are really doing something. Then, of course, it should be clear what we were saying before, we are doing this as, uh, let's say, we are developing this in the project, but the legacy will be into that specific system. And so you know that everything that, let's say, you are spending now will be, there will be a legacy afterwards. And this is also important to say. And then the other thing is that, uh, um, again, from the project point of view, we say uh, we need to have a place to facilitate the activity of the project. So we need to have a place in which our colleagues that are developing the scientific part of uh, SOCHIC can easily find some of the data set they need in order to do the assessment or do the cross-validation or do the uh, assimilation from the models and so on. For example, the inclusion of the GLORY uh, V12 uh, V1 in the system was uh, an answer to one specific need from VP4 and VP5 because they were needing a such um, product in order to do some of the assessment they are doing uh, in their activities. So having uh, that product within the SOCIC uh, interface uh, is facilitating our colleagues to find this data, to download the data and the job. So they have not to care 
how to down, again how to download this data from a third system and so on we are we are taking care about that because we are let's say the data manager <laughs> for, for this and this uh, somehow doing this uh, as uh, a data management uh, work package we are really fulfilling our duties and uh, supporting our uh, colleagues in doing uh, the, the work yeah, thank you. And and you've already answered at least partially the question in chat from Jan Bohr uh, regarding how the Sochik data management system will be maintained after the end of this this project, which is something that I, I was hoping to ask as well. So thanks, Jan Bohr, for that. Um, I don't know if you have any more specifics on on the legacy planning for, for this. Uh, and also, I, I just want to add that I know you are involved with the Ocean Ice Project doing some similar work. And if there's some sort of rollover that happens in terms of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You anticipated something. <laughs> yes, there will be some rollover in Ocean Ice for sure. Actually, the idea uh, is also to keep improving the system. And one focus in Ocean Ice will be to develop some complementary tools that we are, at the moment we are, uh, we are missing. For example, the idea is to work in collaboration with some uh, other initiatives that are developing virtual research labs in which you can run scripts. And so the idea is to develop some um, dedicated scripts that can consume some of the data that we are making available uh, via Sochik and Ocean Ice and SUS in order to be consumed in an easy way from people that are, let's say, are somehow in the middle between an expert and an non expert. And so facilitate again the, the things. Uh, the legacy will be, as we say, uh, towards SUS from one side. So the map viewer will be, uh, I mean, uh, the legacy will be in SUS. Uh, from the data management point of view, as uh, I mentioned, one key point that we are trying to do is to really uh, facilitate the implementation of some of the key components that we develop in the uh, data management, in the backend data management of the Sochik project. For example, the AirDAP Docker I was mentioning, uh, I was showing that has been developed by physics, but of course, together with Sochik, we improved and we are already deploying in some of the, our colleagues' institute because then we have, I mean, some, let's say, a very tangible outcome that can be consumed. I mean, the Docker will be in GitHub uh, with the DOI under the node. We, we are still um, doing that part of the job because we are finalizing some of the configuration of uh, the, the, the system, some configuration files in order to be provided with Docker to facilitate the uptake of these two. And so the legacy will be there. So you know that you can install the system. And once you have installed the system, your data can be easily consumed by integrators like Emonet, Copernic, and so on. So the legacy will be that we are really setting up a methodology in order to facilitate the interoperability of the data. And uh, we are not uh, somehow storing the data ourselves that when we finish the project, you may have problem with the funding to be allocated for the database and so, and so on. But we are really implementing tools that can be maintained by the institutes that are going to keep working on the field. And so they can maintain themselves the data and make this data interoperable and enable in other system. Then, of course, I mean, there are, uh, we have also to say that uh, um, Imonet is not finishing tomorrow because we were confirmed as a program for the next 10 years. And so we already have sort of middle term legacy. Copernicus is not finishing tomorrow. It, I mean, it's lasting even longer than uh, Imonet at the moment. <laughs> the planning is uh, very middle term, long term. So we know that. Uh, be interoperable and be connected with these entities um, can guarantee us uh, the legacy of uh, what we are developing. Yeah, I, I think that's an extremely important point uh, that these are sort of embedded into these larger data programs uh, with the EU institutions. Yeah, so the the project is not, not isolated in, in the collection and presentation of the data. Um, 
I would encourage anyone to ask any last questions that they have. We've we've run slightly over the one hour mark. Not that we have a, a hard cutoff here, but if anyone has any other questions, then uh, please go ahead. Um, and you've you've already provided some answers to the questions that I that I had uh, prepared for you in terms of the the legacy planning, next steps. Uh, you mentioned the the connections with ESA through Copernicus, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, the fair process you're engaged with as well, yeah. Um, so I was I think, a MFA evangelist. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you don't really have your your finger on the on the pulse of of uh, marine data collection here. It's very impressive stuff. So I I think rather than than uh, drag you through any more of my questions, I will uh, conclude here. Um, I I want to apologize for the small technical hiccup before uh, Windows updates always always keeps things interesting. I guess you could say so. If there's no other questions from the audience, I want to thank everyone who joined online. Um, and I, I want to thank you, Antonio, for your presentation. Um, I want to thank the EPB Secretariat, especially Ava, for the promotion of the event so that we we got some people here to, to listen uh, in real time. The event will be posted, a recording of the event will be posted on the SoChic YouTube channel in the near future. And I, I want to flag a couple of things coming up, the first of which is a SoChic policy briefing. So we will have a policy briefing on the SoChic project held uh, jointly with the EU PolarNet 2 project. So that should be quite interesting and there will be a live stream available for that, it, it, it'll be a hybrid event. Um, and that will happen on May 3rd, uh, tentatively at 2 p.m. Uh, and if you check the EPB website and our, our social media channels and Sochic channels, you should see advertisements for that in the very near future. Um, there will also be, this, this is the last work package specific webinar that we're holding for Sochic. So you can see all of the other work packages already on the YouTube channel and there will be a wrap-up webinar. So it will go over all of the work that's been done, um, sort of the, the results of SoChic and their impacts. That will be held later this year. So we will start advertising that uh, in, in the more distant future, but please do keep it in your mind. And uh, with that, I think we have reached the end here. So thanks again to everyone. Thank you, Antonio. And uh, We'll speak again soon, I hope. Bye, yeah, everybody. Thank you. thank you, everyone. And of course, if you have any further question, uh, you are I mean, very welcome to contact us. <laughs> yeah, that's that's. Uh, if you have any questions boiling in your mind, you can you can always contact Antonio directly. Okay. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>